Hello and welcome. Today we are going to talk about export-import pricing. Price is one of the important factors in determining a company's ability to compete in today's global environment. For many companies, pricing policies and procedures are kind of a secret actually because they don't want to share that information with the competitors. Export prices should be high enough to make a reasonable profit. However, it should also be low enough to where you can remain competitive in the marketplace. There are non-price factors which become important. Keep in mind that products rarely sell on one factor alone. So the exporter should be competitive on non-price factors of various kinds. The sources of non-price competition can include reliable delivery, short delivery time, product reliability, product quality, as well as many other features that are considered to be unique by your specific customers that you're targeting. So this form of product differentiation based on specific characteristics of a product or service tends to give the company a competitive advantage in a global marketplace. Price and non-price factors can include reliability, delivery time, pro product reliability, product quality, design, support services, and financial services, which can give you an edge if you are doing it the right way and efficiently in the market. The objectives of pricing could be to either increase your market share, to grow your profits, or even to target a certain level of return on your investment or the investment of the stockholders. Sometimes you can have high markups when there are a few competitors and your product is very differentiated from everybody else. On the other hand, sometimes you have low markups, especially when you have a lot of competitors in the market. Some other determinants of export price, uh, which could include internal variables, include cost of production, cost of market research, business travel, product modifications, packing, consultants, freight forwarders, and the level of product differentiation that you have. Um, in the industry from your competitors. Some of the external variables could include the level of supply and demand, location and environment of foreign market, in other words, the host country where you're sending it to. And also the home country regulations could be a factor as well. When it comes to pricing, you can have ethnocentric pricing, polycentric pricing, or geocentric pricing. So ethnocentric pricing is single price at a home and abroad for the product you're selling. So ethnocentric pricing is basically a single price both at home and in a foreign market. Polycentric pricing uh, basically requires you to be sensitive to the needs of the local market and the people and the competitors and so on. Geocentric pricing requires you to take an intermediate position and adjust as needed based on the condition in the region. There are many approaches to export pricing. You can have cost-based pricing. This type of export price is based on the full cost as well as the markup or the full cost plus whatever is the desired amount of return on the investment that you want to recover or get. Marginal pricing is export pricing where the price is based on the variable cost of product that is being produced. There's a difference between skimming versus penetration pricing. Price skimming is charging a premium price for a product. On the other hand, penetration pricing is based on charging lower prices for exports to increase your market share, to get your brand name out there. Demand-based pricing is export pricing where you're basing the price on what the market could actually bear. If the demand is high, your prices might be high. If the demand is low, 
then your price margin of profitability would have to be a little bit lower. Competitive pricing is pricing where you are considering all your competitors in the market and the pressure that you all are under to sell the product as good as theirs with good quality, but maybe similar price as well. There are many, many trade terms when it comes to pricing that you have to be aware of. And the cost could add up based on various terms. For example, X works is where a buyer or agent must collect goods at the seller's work or warehouse. But the agent here charges a fee usually. So now I would like for you all to pay attention to my good friend, Dr. Noel Fernandez, who was an exporter and importer for many years in his former career. So he did this for a living for, for many, many years between the United States and India and many other countries. Um, so he speaks based on experience. Now, when it comes to export pricing, keep in mind that the price of the product is not the only consideration uh, in terms of where you buy the product. So a country might have a very cheap price for the product, but there might be other hidden cost associated with buying the product from a specific country and importing it to yours or vice versa. So consider the rules and regulations, the policies, the, the, the taxes uh, and other regulation uh, fees that would be part of uh, taking the product out of the country and selling it to um, your customers. So consider all those prices before you make a decision in terms of where to buy your product from. So let us hear an example from Dr. Noel Fernandez. Hi, first of all, thank you, Professor Bahaudin, for the nice introduction. And uh, hello and swadikap everyone in, uh, in Bangkok or wherever you're joining in from. Uh, I know it's usually very hard to stay awake after lunch, but uh, I will try to not put you to sleep, okay? So, a little background about myself. I am also an alumnus of uh, your university, IIS. I did my PhD here a few years ago, uh, and Professor Bahaudin was my was my guide and advisor for my thesis. And uh, and I have actually worked almost fifteen years in shipping, logistics, international trade. I have worked in India, Dubai, U.S., Europe. And in the last 14, uh, 15 years, I have traveled around 40 countries, you know, meeting with suppliers, customers. And for me, I think that was the most fun part of my job. Uh, so now I work as a supply chain and international trade consultant, and I'm also an angel investor. And I invest uh, in uh, supply chain technology startups in Asia. Uh, so that's what I do for now. And that's why I travel um, a lot in, in Asia, trying to meet with startups. So I'm here uh, to talk about uh, my personal experience as, as an export import manager. And uh, since this is actually a bachelor's degree program, I'm not going to use a lot of jargons. I'm going to make this presentation very simple. And my goal at the end of this presentation is to make you confident to be able to handle a shipment all by yourself. So that's my goal. And I hope uh, we do it together. So you guys ready? Of course you are. <laughs> okay. So firstly, let's look at the most basic model of export and import, which you already, I think, know, where you have a seller on one side and you have a buyer on the other side, and in between is an international border, right? The goods have to pass from one country into another country. That's how the export and import works, right? So whenever this happens, as a manager or as a, as, as a person working in export and import management, you have to be responsible for three main things. One is the flow of information, right? 
flow of information going from the buyer to the seller, the seller going to the buyer, talking about the price, about the input terms, who is going to pay for what. This is the kind of information that goes back and forth. And second is the material moves from one country to the other, right? So there's a flow of material. And then there's a flow of money, which is the buyer pays the seller for the goods he received. So as a practitioner or as a manager in future, your main job will be to manage these three flows. That is the, the basic job of anybody who handles international trade, manage these three flows. How do you manage the flow of information? How do you manage the flow of material? How do you manage the flow of money? So this is the basic model that you need to have in your mind. And this is what I have in my mind whenever I'm into doing any export or import uh, shipments. So now today, if you look, we are uh, living in, uh, this is the reality of today, you know? It's not, it's not the basic model, supply, ship. Uh, the reality of today is you are having bananas coming from Ecuador. You have components and parts coming from Japan or Korea. You have cement coming from uh, Vietnam, shoes coming from Italy. So this is what is happening in today's reality, right? It's ev everybody needs things and most of the things come from other countries. This is the reality of today, right? Growth in population, right? This is what is happening today, which means there is more people, which is more demand. And if you look at uh, India and China, they may not agree on many things, but on population growth, looks like they seem to be on the same page. Uh, so what happens when there is population growth? If you see population has increased almost three times from 1955 to now. And if you look at international trade, that's almost 20 times from 1955 to now. So this population growth coupled with the demand of what people need is helping this international trade grow by leaps and bounds. So that is why if you see, this is what is happening now in the world. And the reality is not the basic model anymore. The reality is this complex supply chain model that is, that is in work. So let's just look at this bicycle manufacturer here in the middle, right? This is a bicycle manufacturer. He has two suppliers. One supplies him the hardware, one supplies him the frame. This hardware supplier has his own suppliers. These guys have their own suppliers. And if you look at the down, downstream where you're selling the product, the bicycle manufacturer has the wholesalers, wholesalers have retailers and retailers going to the customers. So this is basically the reality of today where, where things are uh, not just like the basic model. It's very complex and uh, uh, it's, like a, it's like a web of everyone in the working together to make, to make the product move from one place to the other. When we see in today's world, as you all already know, and I have witnessed in a lot of companies that every department is trying to work on their own, you know, working in silos, like the export department is working on their own, trying to optimize their function finance department acting on their own, trying to optimize their function, you know, transportation warehousing, everybody's trying to do their own things in their own silos and trying to make their department look better. And sometimes this is not good for the whole company because when you try to optimize one department and you damage somebody else, the total result is not good. So you need to work together and voila, this is what is happening today. This is what is going on today. Here is the hero, the supply chain approach that most companies try to use today, where the basic thing is, like here, if you look at uh, the, the sourcing, where you buy from suppliers, like the making of the product by the company and delivering, all these things are planned and enabled together. They do this together so that they can make everything seamless. And and in this kind of chain where everything is related, the chain is as strong as the weakest link. So if one function is weak, it actually affects the whole system. 
and the end result is not as good as if all were strong together. So this is the supply chain approach, which is being used now by a lot of companies. And you know that everybody talks about supply chain today, the bottlenecks, supply chain, uh, containers and shipments getting stranded, not coming in. And everybody talking about how to make supply chain more resilient, more strong. So this is all a part of supply chain. And this is an, this is an important field that everybody is now looking into. So now let's get practical, okay? So this is why I'm here to make it practical and to make you confident and maybe a semi-expert in importing a shipment. So we take this example, very simple example of importing golf clubs from China to Bangkok, okay? So you have to import 250 golf clubs golf clubs comes in a set uh, so you have to import 250 golf clubs in a 20 foot container by sea and the chinese supplier is going to give it to you for 250 dollars and you need to bring it to bangkok so how will you proceed as an import manager what how do you look at things as an import manager so the first thing as a practitioner or what I used to do is, I used to imagine this picture. This picture used to help me to put things into perspective. So look, if the buyer is, if the seller is here in China, his golf clubs are sitting here, I need to move it all the way from here to Bangkok here. So what are the things in between that I need to take care of? So basically very simple, intuitive kind of thinking. So if the seller is here, I need to bring all the product, product to Bangkok. How am, I, how am I going to move it? So here, this is what I think professor was talking to you a little while ago about INCO terms. And during the flow of information, right? Which I told you one of the important flows is information flow. This is where the buyers and the sellers agree on who is going to pay for what. So in this example of ours in the golf club, the seller is saying, you have to take everything from my warehouse. You have to do all the work. It's your responsibility to pick up the golf clubs from my site. So basically he's telling that it's an X works shipment. That means the buyer, that means you as an import manager have to bring the golf clubs to Bangkok from China. So this is your responsibility. So how do you go about it? Now, Professor talked to you about the INCO terms and we established that this is X works. I'm not going to go into the details, which I think Professor already showed you in the video. We know that we have to buy X works, 250 golf clubs from China. We have to bring it to Bangkok. So this is the basic picture that I have in mind. And the most important thing that as an import manager you will do is do a landed cost calculation. This is what you will have to do as an import manager. This is the reality of the job. How do you calculate the total cost of bringing these golf clubs from China to Bangkok? And with the, with the help of this picture in mind, you can kind of figure it out. So basically when I look at that picture, there are these things that come into my mind all of a sudden. These are the things that I think about. What is the price of the product? I know that he said, $200 is the golf club price that the seller is telling me. How is it packaged? You know, country of origin, I know it's coming from China. Do I need to inspect this cargo there? Do I need to spend some money to check if these golf clubs are okay or not? Do I need to take insurance on this product so that if anything happens on the way, you know, I'm covered as an importer? Do I use a freight forwarder there in China who will help me to pick up this product from the, from the factory? and bring it to the port, ship it, and bring it to, to Bangkok. How do I use a freight forwarder? How do I find him? Where do I get him? Who will do the trucking? Who will move these golf clubs from the factory to the port? Will the freight forwarder do it? How much it's going to cost? What is the port handling charges? Does the port charge something to put a container on the ship? And when it comes to Bangkok, 
what is the customs duty on golf clubs how much do i pay do, do, do the customs do i have to pay any duty on it then currency fluctuation china is selling to me in us dollars but i am going to sell to somebody in thailand in thai baht i cannot sell in chinese currency so how how does the currency fluctuation works should i hedge my currency do you think thai baht is going to be strong or not so all these things suddenly start coming into my mind these are the things i work around is there some kind of a trade agreement between china and thailand can i get some some discount from buying it from china so and what is the valuation how do customs calculate the duty of on the product all these kind of things come into my mind and and this helps me to do the landed cost analysis let me go to the excel excel file because i have a small exercise for you to do very simple not complicated math we are not going to do any optimization or anything we just complete just simple addition multiplication kind of thing that we learned in in 6th okay. grade excel is my best so, friend i like you using excel whenever i do landed cost analysis it helps me a lot i don't do it now anymore but i used to do it a lot when i was importing and exporting so this is the landed cost right now you you know that you are buying this x works from china yeah you know the price of the product say so the the cost you know is 200 dollars you know that right now you know you are doing some inspection this is what you already planned you are doing right you are doing going to going to send an inspector there to look at the goods before it is shipped the inspector is going to charge you 300 dollars to do it so you know 300 dollars for for the shipment you are going to take insurance on this product because you want to be safe right so that's a cost you have to truck the product from the factory to the port in china so there is a trucking cost set 100 dollars i'm giving everything in dollars because usually all the all the all the trade international trade is done in us dollars port handling the port charges 50 dollars right the ocean freight is 1000 dollars to bring that container this 250 units you will put in a 20 foot container and that container will cost you 1000 dollars to come to bangkok port then at the port in bangkok you pay 60 dollars to unload that container you pay a customs duty of 10% on the golf club there is a vat in bangkok 6 7% and then you take the container from the bangkok port to your factory or to your shop wherever where you are going to keep it and from there you are going to sell it to your customers right so these are all the costs that you have found out by talking to freight forwarders by doing your own checks you know by getting all the information that you need to develop the landed cost uh to 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 develop this landed cost so you know basically what you're doing is finding the cost per item total landed cost how much it is going to cost me for one golf club from china to come to thailand so i know what is my total cost so with by knowing my total cost i can know at what price i can sell right you don't want to sell below the cost you want to make a profit so you sell above the cost and you already know that customers are going to pay you 400 dollars for each golf set so is it worth buying this from china is it worth how do you know that by doing the landed cost analysis you find out what is the cost per item if i am going to make a profit and the profit is good enough for me i am going to do it simple right so this is what we are going to do so this also helps you when you know the landed cost you also know what profit you are going to make and you also know what kind of discounts you can give to a customer can you give him some more discount because now you have your cost is lower you know you can okay you buy 10 i'll give you 10 dollars discount or 20 dollars discount you can do this by knowing the total landed costs right so this is the exercise that you need to do you need to tell me now you need to do your small little math here right and convert all these cost to cost per unit like here cost per unit so one golf club set how much does it cost me all the way from china to bangkok you know the cost for one the product is 200 dollars now all these other costs here are not per is it it's not per golf club this is per shipment that means this 300 dollars is for 250 clubs golf club golf sets right so you need to convert this into unit you all know how to convert it right easy right you take you take 300 dollars divided by 
$250. This is for one, the inspection charge for one golf club will be $1.2. Get, you, you get my point? It's easy to do the conversion. To convert this total cost that you have here into cost per unit. And then I want to get here the answer. What is the cost, total landed cost per unit? And you know the selling price, as I showed you, is $400. So do I make a profit? Should I buy from China? Should I do this or not? You are the import manager and you will tell me whether I should do it or not. Okay. So professor, should they break into groups or how do you want to? Yeah. So right now, if you all want to take a picture or a screen, uh, uh, print screen, so you can have this data uh, with you in case you don't have it already. So just do a print screen so you can uh, look at uh, and then copy and paste it into some other document with you so you can easily refer to it. That would be good. Um, and then I'm going to put you into your breakout room so you can take 10 minutes to come up with an answer. And when you come back, you can tell your answer to Dr. Fernandez, and then he will explain uh, how close you are to his answers. So make sure you take a picture right now so you can have the data. And I'm gonna open up all your rooms again for you. So you can join your room now for about 10 minutes, and then I'll give you one minute warning to come back. So go ahead and go to your teams and talk with your teammates, see, see what you come up with. Uh, okay, so everybody's back. I, I think uh, Dr. Fernandez wanted you to tell him what you came up with, okay? So that was, that was the point. So I'm gonna start with group number one. Okay, so this is group number one. What did you guys come up with overall, just, just overall numbers? Um, so what's so, what, what the cost you want again? Um, the total lending cost or profit? The cost per item. Per from, item on lending cost, right? Uh-huh. Um, our calculation was not mistaken. Um, we believe to be 207.94. 207.94. Okay. Unit. And okay. profit? Profit would be... Uh, 400 minus that number, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So any other questions, uh, Dr. Fernandez, for group one? Uh, no. I think uh, okay. I will do the calculation with uh, with you on the, on the uh, as soon as we get all the answers. And then you all can see where you all must have where you guys are right and where you guys might have missed Number something. Two, okay, so tell us your answers. Yes, uh, we got a total cost at two hundred and forty nine point three, and the profit will be one hundred and fifty one. Okay, all right. Group number three. That was group two, and this is group yeah. three. Group number three. Group number yeah, three. Um, our profits, the result is uh, 119.66 and the total cost is 280.34. Okay. So somebody was at 205, somebody is at 260, somebody is 280, right? So we're getting different costs. So we will see who is right. Group number okay. four. Group number four. This group say they are crazy and enjoying all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I like this group. <laughs> Is it, yeah, they're the laugh factory. Let's see what they got. Okay, no problem. So you didn't get a final, final number yet. Okay, so let's go to group five. All right, so we go to per unit to under 70.9, and then the profit to under 90, same as the, that group uh, round. And then the total cost about 249. Okay. Okay, guys. Okay, so that's the five so groups. First of all, I uh, need to give you full credit for trying because this is, I think, the first time you did a landed cost analysis. Uh, I remember when I did it the first time, I made, <laughs> I made a big mistake, almost lost my job. <laughs> I don't want you guys to do that. So let's, let's do it. Uh, together okay I'll, i will do it on the excel sheet and then we'll see what is the what is the total cost landed cost per unit okay okay so the first thing that you already know is that 
the supplier in China is going to charge you $200, right? For one golf set, right? So you have to buy 250 of those, right? So for one golf set, you already know the price because we are going to calculate the cost per unit. For one unit is $200, you know that already, right? So we go to the next. Now you, you take an inspection company there and he, you ask him how much you're going to charge me to inspect uh, the, uh, the, uh, this, this shipment of 250 units. And he said, I will charge you $300, right? So that means for each, un for each golf club, it's going to be $300 divided by 250, which is 1.2, which I already showed you before, right? So now you go to insurance. Insurance is always charged, not on the num insurance is, has to be on some value. It's $200 is insurance. So if I take 3%, so if I take 3%, 3% into $200 is $6 for one unit. Did you guys get this correct or wrong? This might be the place where you must have been a little wrong. 3% of $200 is $6, right? Then you go to the trucking and they say they will charge $100 to move this because this is all moving this is all moving in a 20 foot container if you look at at the problem that the, the question i told is everything is moving in a 20 foot container right so he's going to charge you 100 dollars to move that whole container which has 250 units so 100 dollars you will take that divide it by 250 units so this is your trucking charge, $0.4 per unit, okay? So now you're going to the port handling cost. Port handling is charged also $50 for one container which has 250 units inside, $0.2. Ocean freight, $1,000 for the whole container of 250 units. $1,000 divide again by 250 is $4 per, per unit, okay? Now, when you come to Bangkok, they charge you $60 to unload that container and to unload that container. So you take $60 divided by 250, $0.24. Now, customs duty, they are going to charge Customs officer is going to charge you 10% of $200, which is the price of the product. Customs duty is always charged on price of, the, of what you bought it for. So this is the $200 you bought it for. So I'm going to take 10% multiplied by 200. 10% of 200 is $20, right? Then you have to pay VAT. VAT is 7% of the price of the product. So you take 7% multiplied by 200 is $14. Then trucking, to take the truck, to take the container from the port to your, to your, to your store or to your factory is $75 divided by 250. So this is my total cost. These are all the cost. These are the, this was the cost. Then I converted all this into unit cost. Now I'm going to add it up. I'm going to add up all these costs. Somebody got 246, something near, near that number. Who was that group? Very close yeah. to this number. Added it to 46 and, and cents, but not the right for it. Very, very good. That was, that is the, 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 you're very close to that number, which is very good. So basically, do you see the calculation is very easy? Only sometimes maybe you all forgot that these 250 units is going into one container. And so you need to divide it by 250, right? So, oh, yes. Yes, that was the... Problem, that was yeah. the confusion maybe, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this 300 is usually, they're charging for the whole shipment. 
hundred dollars for the whole shipment, fifty dollars for the whole two hundred and fifty. So that's why you're you're taking the you're dividing it by the number of units to get the per cost unit, right? So now your customer in Thailand, uh, Bangkok is going to pay you four hundred dollars for the unit, right? So how much profit you're going to make? Sales price minus landed cost. Hundred and fifty three dollars, and at today's exchange rate in Thailand, which is I think thirty two point nine zero, I guess today is today's rate. Five thousand baht you make on each unit that you sell. Should you buy, or should you not buy? Groups, group one. If you're making profit, should you buy or should you not buy? Yes, yes, we'll buy. Yes, very good. Group number two. Yes, of course. Of course, okay. So everybody agrees that you need to buy. We're making a profit. Why not? Right? We go ahead and buy. Now there's a slight twist. There's a slight twist, and the twist is you have a customer, you have a supplier in Vietnam. And he's telling you that I will offer you this product, golf club, two hundred and ten dollars, ten dollars more than China. Ten dollars more than China. Should you should you buy from Vietnam or China? Vietnam is saying ten dollars more. You can buy from me, two hundred and ten dollars, not two hundred dollars. You buy from me. But you have to pay me two hundred and ten dollars. China is saying you buy from me is only two hundred dollars. From whom should you buy? Very easy question, right? From whom should you buy? Group one. Vietnam. Huh? Vietnam. Vietnam is yeah. charging you ten dollars more. Oh, oh, oh! Then China. China. Group number two. China. Group number three. China. Group number four. They haven't come up with the answer yet. No, just uh, no, just my question. China is saying two hundred dollars. Vietnam is saying two hundred and ten dollars. Who you, whom you should buy from? China or Vietnam? China. China. Yes. Right, so this is what I used to think when I when I started out. I will just look at the price of the product. China two hundred, Vietnam two hundred and ten. My out Vietnam, out China. I'm going to buy from China, but that's not the reality. That's not how it works. So let's go, because I told you when you're doing landed cost, you need to look at all those factors that I told you. Right, inspection. Inspection. Is there a trade agreement? All those things. So when I go into Vietnam, so now I'm going to go into Vietnam. Okay, two hundred and ten dollars. Okay, they're going to charge. Right, as I told you, inspection is the same. Just imagine. Suppose inspection is the same, insurance is the same, trucking is the same. Port handling is the same. This you find out, right? You you will call somebody in Vietnam. You forward and you get all these charges, and you find that this is same. But then you see that the freight to bring from Ho Chi Minh City to Bangkok is only three hundred dollars. To bring from China is one thousand dollars. Port handling looks like the same. Customs duty. There is no customs duty if you buy from Vietnam. Why? Because of ASEAN agreement. ASEAN. Anything you bring from each other country. No duty, no customs duty, zero percent. So when you see your transport cost is low, there is no duty to buy from Vietnam, and then you look at your total cost per unit, your total landed cost per unit is two hundred and thirty-four dollars. And when you buy from China, it was two hundred and forty-six dollars, right? So now, if you know the landed cost to bring from China, and you know the landed cost to bring from Vietnam, 
now as an import manager, where will you buy from? Vietnam. Group number one. Vietnam. Exactly. Group number two. Vietnam. Correct. Group number three. Vietnam. Perfect. Group number four. Vietnam. Tuk Tong. So this is what it is. It is landed cost. Just don't look at one factor. Oh, price is low. I buy from here. Look at everything. What is it involved? So when you do that landed cost, when you look at the when you look at that picture, look at all the costs. Add up all the costs and see what is the landed cost. How much that is, does it actually cost for me to bring it from China to Bangkok or from Vietnam to Bangkok? Same thing. If somebody says in Korea, I will give it to you for $250 or whatever. Do your landed cost analysis. See, look, look at all the suppliers. Do the landed cost for each of them. See which one gives you the best value, and that one you should go for. Okay. Don't just look at price. Most of the people just look at price, and then they forget the, all the other factors that are involved. Is there a free trade agreement? Maybe there is no duty. Who knows? Maybe there is no VAT if you buy from here. I don't know. So look at all those things. Look at the whole picture, and so when you do the landed cost analysis, you get the right picture, and you can make the right decision okay guys so now i think all you all of you guys can become import managers right you know you know the trick to do landed cost analysis so when you know this trick of doing landed cost analysis basically this is half of the job that import managers do try to find out all the information all the cost of moving a product from one place to the other and seeing if you can make a profit or not right so that is what you have to do. So if I do a comparison here, which I already did, so I make more profit in Vietnam. I make $165. So I, and if I buy from China, I make, make uh, 100 and from Vietnam 165 and from China 164. So my answer is I will buy from Vietnam. So this is, so you make this comparison from all the suppliers and you come up with the right answer. Okay. So as I said, when you're doing the total landed cost analysis, look at all these. Don't just look at price of product. Just look at one, one factor. That is, the, that is only one factor from all the other factors. So calculate the cost for each factor that, that impacts the shipment and come up with the total landed cost. Total landed cost is the most important thing that I used to do and most of them do when they do the, uh, when they do the calculations to decide whether to import from here from China or whether I have to import from India or whether I have to import from Vietnam. So this is a good exercise for you. And when you join any companies, they might ask you to do a landed cost analysis. They'll give you like an example like this and tell you, please do landed cost analysis. And then you can boop, 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 easy and you get the right answer. Okay. So this is the, this is the, the cost that I did. And I posted here for your slides. If professor is sharing, you can, look at it and you know you can get the right answers so in the second scenario as we said the price was 210 dollars and most of us said that no we will buy from vietnam but when we did the total landed cost analysis we found out that it is better to buy from vietnam because transportation cost was lower and there was no duty because of the asean agreement so so we decided to buy from Vietnam. So, so, so we are almost coming to the close of this presentation, right? So what I feel is that for uh, managers, because you all are going to be, you all, this is a bachelor's degree in, in business administration. Okay. So you're all future managers, maybe running your own companies, right? There's one thing that I have learned from my experience is these answers, you do landed cost and everything, that's all okay. But still, as a manager, you have to balance these two things, which I always had a hard time and which you will also have. How do you balance cost and level of service, right? Basically, all you always want is you want to buy at the lowest cost 
and you want to give the best service to the customer, right? This is what everybody wants to do. But these are two opposite things. When you lower your cost, usually the service level goes down, right? I will tell you, I'll, uh, I'll give you an example, right? Now, if one of the golf club customer says that I want this golf club on Sunday after, after four or five days, I want it on Sunday. Can you give me one golf club on Sunday? Now, just imagine you want to lower your cost and you bring it by C and C takes three weeks. You think that customer is happy? If, you, if he wants it after five days and you're saying, no, I'll, you can pay me $400, but I can only give you after three weeks. He will say, no, I, no, I don't want this. So that means in order to meet his level of service, right? You cannot, your cost has to change. Now to give him in five days, you don't want it by C. You're going to bring it by air. You're going to bring it by a plane, right? So when you bring it by plane, your cost will go up, right? Your cost usually compared to C and by plane, your cost by plane is usually higher. So your cost by plane goes up. So now you cannot charge him $400. So you tell him, okay, Mr. Customer, I can give it to you on Sunday, but you have to pay me $500. Die my. And he really wants the golf clubs. He said, die lie. You bring it by air. You bring it by plane. Right? So there's this balancing act. It's not very easy. Like, okay, I will just take lower cost and I will always give the best service. It has to be a balance. So this is what import expert managers do. Every somebody wants this tomorrow. Somebody says that I will pay you low price. So balancing act. Like this seesaw. This will be you, manager, trying to balance cost and level of service all the time. Uh, this will be the this will be the, the thing that you will be doing the most. So as I said before, there is no perfect solution. Like you find landed cost in China was the best. So this is my perfect solution. And then you found no, Vietnam is better. So decisions keep changing all the time. Everything is not the same. Decisions keep changing. And as I said, as a manager or future managers, always trade off, always balance. See what is best for the customer. And can you do it? Can you increase the cost? Can you bring it by plane? Can you, all those things you need to, you know, weigh, you know, and keep, doing that to give the level of service to the customers. So always, uh, that will be one of your important goals as, as import and export managers, this balancing act. And this balancing act, how well do you balance? All comes from information that you can gather, right? You found out that this guy in Vietnam or supplier is saying $210. Then you call and you make more information. You gather information. How much is the transportation? Is there customs duty? Is there is there is this zero you get all that information that information is key for you to make the right decision and to balance should i bring it by air should i bring it by plane how much will it cost so the information gathering all that information makes you can can help you to make better and good decisions and when you make good decisions you know the company does better the company gets better more salary more bonus everyone is happy right and one thing that I always feel as a manager is that don't be, don't be happy with what the situation is today. For me as a manager, I always used to look for what is going on in my industry. What is changing? What is disrupting the industry? What technologies are coming that can help me manage those three flows, right? Information flow, the product flow, and the money flow. Can I use some software or technology that, that can help me and lower my costs? Can I get this technology that I can see exactly what is happening in my chain? So all these kind of things you have to look. Don't just be the, okay, I'm going to just, this is my job. I'm just going to do this. And there are some people who just like to do that. It's okay. But for me, I always wanted more, more information. I want to see what's going on in the industry. I talk to people. I find out what's going on. What is the new innovation that's coming? What people are talking about? How things are changing in the, in the industry? All those things really like uh, was interesting to me. So, and when you know, when you, when you get into this, you get more informed, you know, you, you can be a better leader. You can be a better manager. So let me give you one example that I, I had. I had these three customers in Korea, right? 
big customers of mine, LG, uh, Samsung, and Hyosung. There were these three big customers in Korea, and they wanted some product from Russia, right? But they said to me, you have to bring everything up to my factory in, in, uh, in, uh, in Korea. It's the opposite of what we did now, right? Now, like you are the importer and you did everything, but now I was a seller, he's asking me to do everything from Russia to Korea. And it's not as simple as we did this shipment from China of golf clubs. This product is chemicals, hazardous chemicals, right? That they need to make some products. Hazardous chemicals, liquid form, not doesn't go in a container, it goes in, it goes in ships. So I had to move this product from Russia in rail cars. Like rail cars have some tanks. You put the product in the rail cars, you bring it to Finland. From Russia, I brought it to Finland, put it in a big tank there in Finland, take a small barge, move it to, to Rotterdam, which is in Europe. And from there, a big ship will come and take the product from Rotterdam to Busan in Korea. In Busan, again, I put it in a tank, in a big chemical tank. And from that tank, I was delivering by tank trucks to LG, to Hyosung, to Samsung. I, had, I was doing the delivery. So I was managing all these things. And LG, Samsung, they did not want to do this because it, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of risk. They just say, you give it to me here. I don't want to do this. But for me, I like that. I like, no, give me this. I want to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. That's what actually uh, enticed me more. How do I do this? How do I move this product from Russia to Finland, to Rotterdam, to Busan, then by trucks to, to my customer? And I'll say, okay, I will do this for you, but I'm going to charge you more, right? You don't want to do it, I'll do it. I'm going to take the risk, but I'm going to charge you more. So instead of say $1,000 per ton, I'm going to charge you $1,050 a ton, but I will do the job for you. I will manage the whole supply chain. So this is how it was for me. So as I tell you, don't be afraid to get something is new. Oh my God, this is new. It's very difficult. No, pick up the phone, call people, get information and you can do it. Okay. So that's what I wanted to tell you and hope you guys liked the presentation and I hope you guys can now be confident to import golf clubs from Vietnam or from China. Okay. Thank All right. Thank you, much. students. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Noel Fernandez. What a really, really good presentation, realistic examples that you've been through. Uh, and, and obviously the numbers, uh, just looking at not just the cost, but the added uh, cost uh, associated with the product. Uh, so we've only looked at it in the textbook, but you actually brought it to light in reality, uh, especially yeah. the difference between uh, buying something from China versus Vietnam, and then, you know, look at the price <coughs> of the product might be a little bit higher in one location, uh, but obviously being part of the regional integrated agreement, like ASEAN or NAFTA, all of that removes some of those taxes uh, or additional costs. So that should be looked at in order to make a good final decision. So exactly. thank you very much for that. We appreciate it. Thank you, and Professor. You took and thank you, my time. fellow, my fellow alumni from IIS. I uh, wish oh. you all uh, uh, success in your course, and hope I see you as big managers and business owners in the future. Okay. And that's that's the goal, obviously, for all of them. Some of them are international business. Some of them are English majors. But hopefully, everybody will be obviously successful in whatever fields they choose. Okay, so I would like to thank Dr. Noel Fernandez for providing us with this real world example of how prices can add up when you're considering which country to buy the product from. So when there are regional integration agreements between uh, a number of countries or bilateral agreements between your country and another country, you should always take advantage of that because the final price of your product could be much cheaper compared to if you will get it from another country where there is no bilateral agreement. Uh, so take advantage of these uh, tax incentives. 
in uh, agreements like the ASEAN agreement or NAFTA agreement or any bilateral agreement between two countries. Good luck in your import-export business and I wish you great success in what you do. Good luck in being in the import and export business.